Hi everyone, I hope you're having a great day today. I thought maybe we could start another book called Heir Apparent by Vivian Van de Velde. And here we go. Chapter 1. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> it was my 14th birthday and I was arguing with a bus. How pathetic is that? Even before the bus had started in on me, my mood wasn't exactly the best it's ever been. Birthdays do that to me. This year, I didn't even have a good excuse. I had actually received my birthday gift from my father on time, which might have been a sign he was making an effort to be a more considerate and involved dad. Of course, if he was really considerate and involved, he wouldn't have had his secretary call to ask me what a gift certificate I wanted for my birthday. Whatever. Birthday equals don't mess with me mood. So where was I? Oh, there. so there I was on my way to cash in my gift certificate, riding on a bus powered by artificial intelligence, emphasis on the artificial. I saw the picketers just as the bus paged me. Passenger D Giannine Bola Belisario, you asked to disembark at this Rasmussen Gaming Center, but there is a civil disturbance at your stop. Do you wish to continue to another destination, or would you prefer to be returned to the location at which you boarded? The voice was kind and polite and only slightly metallic. I was not polite. I sighed loudly. Are they on strike? I asked into the speaker embedded in the armrest. There was a brief pause while the bus's computer brain accessed the central information. Rasmussen employees are not on strike, the bus reassured me. At just about the same time that I could make out the picketer's signs, the demonstration is by members of the CPOC. I sighed even louder and pronounced it CPOC. It stands for Citizens to Protect Our Children. As a 14-year-old, I qualify by society's definition as a child. I am willing to accept protection from stray meteors, ec ectoterrorists, and my seven-year-old cousin, Todd, but I don't feel in need of protecting by GPOC or CPOC, which strongly believes that only G-rated movies should be made and that libraries should stock only nice, uplifting books that promote solid family values. Nice being defined as nothing supernatural, nothing violent, nothing scary. That about kills my entire reading list. I think there are a couple alphabet books they approve of. Still, as far as I knew, this was the first time they'd ever come after Rasmussen. I have excellent timing like that. As the bus passed by the patch of sidewalk, the picketers had claimed I could read their signs. Magic equals Satanism, and violence, violence begets violence, and inappropriate for our children. Why can't you drop me off? I asked. Legally, they aren't allowed to obstruct anyone from going in. I learned that in participation in government class. Rochester Transit Authority is prohibited from letting a minor disembark into a situation that might be hazardous, the bus told me. A little bit artificial intelligence can be an annoying thing. What are they going to do? Smack me on the head with a pamphlet? I asked. The bus didn't answer and kept on moving. I was not going to win an argument. I could tell. Well, then I said, let me off at the next stop. Not if you intend to return to Rasmussen Gaming Center stop, the bus responded. I checked our progress on the real-time electronic route map displayed on the back of the seat in front of me and told the bus, of course not. I want to be dropped off at the art museum. That is on this vehicle's route and is only one block away, the bus told me. Estimated time of arrival, 30 seconds. So much for artificial intelligence. A human bus driver could have guessed that I had not developed a sudden craving for culture. Then again, a human bus driver probably wouldn't have cared any more than the other passengers did. The bus stopped in front of the museum. Have a great day, Gianni Belisario, the bus told me. I smiled and gave a Queen Victoria wave and muttered under my breath, your mother was a toaster oven. As I approached the gaming center, I could see the picketers were quiet and orderly. So using my human intelligence, I deduced they weren't dangerous. Once I got in front of the building, I sprinted for the doorway. 
It was beneath a large red and gold sign flanked by rearing dragons, Rasmussen Gaming Center. At least one of the picketers realized my intent and started quoting some Bible verse at me, complete with yes and thous and wicked ones. I started walking faster, and he started quoting faster, which would have been fine except he was also moving to cut me off. I reached the door and a Rasmussen employee opened it for me, which was better service than they'd ever provided before. He was probably set there to make sure the picketers didn't physically interfere with the customers. Once the door was shut behind me, that blocked out road noise and protester noise alike. The lobby of a Rasmussen Gaming Center looks pretty much like the lobby of a movie theater. Lots of slick posters advertising the latest games, a concession stand, booths where you can feed in tokens and play some of the older virtual reality arcade type games. For a Saturday on a nice May afternoon, the place looked dead. Though the popcorn machine was going, wafting the enticing smell of fresh popcorn all the way down to the doors where I'd come in. But I was self-disciplined and resisted. I went up to the reception desk in the waiting area. The total immersion gaming rooms were beyond where they hook you up to the computer as an individual or with a group to experience a role-playing fantasy. There were a pair of older boys, late high school or maybe even college age, sprawled in the comfy chairs in the waiting area, looking as though they'd been there a while. They glanced up hopefully when they spotted me, then returned to leafing through their catalogs and poking at each other and trying to look cool for the receptionist, who was tapping her computer keys with the speed, concentration, and fervor of someone who had to be playing Tetris instead of working. She must have made a game-ending mistake, for she scowled and looked up. Welcome to Rasmussen Gaming Center, she said. She wore a gown that was a um, medieval style, but sh that shimmered and slowly shifted color, going from pink to lavender to deep purple to blue. I knew that if I watched long enough, it would cycle through the rainbow. There was one of those new gener genetically engineered dragons on her desk, hamster-sized and unpleasant. It had been trying to tip over the receptionist's nameplate, and when I placed my gift certificate on the desk, the little beast lunged at me. He's just playing, the receptionist assured me as I snatched my hand back. It's his way of greeting you. Sure. I have an uncle who will tell you the same thing about his Rottweiler. The receptionist looked at the gift certificate. This will get you half an hour of total immersion game time or 45 tokens for the arcade games up front. You can play your own module or you can join other players. She'd pointed toward the older boys. Her desk dragon dove and nipped at the trailing end of her sleeve. The tiny chain that tethered him to her pen holder yanked him up short, and he hovered his leathery wings fluttering. The receptionist ignored him. They're trying to form up a foursome to play Dragon's Doom. Interested? I don't like to play role-playing games with people. I don't know, and besides, I figured an 8th grade girl with a 7th grader's figure probably wasn't exactly what they'd been hoping for either. No, I'll play the computer-generated characters, I said. <coughs> the receptionist nodded. I could see her set herself on automatic pilot. Because the computer directly stimulates your brain, you will feel as though you're actually experiencing the adventure. She must have said this about a million times a day because she spoke quickly and without inflection, so that if I hadn't known what she was talking about, I wouldn't have known what she was talking about. Half an hour of game time will take you through the three days of your chosen computer adventure. You smell the smells, taste the taste, feel the texture of the clothes you're wearing, and the things you touch. You will experience cold if your computer persona is in a situation where he or she would feel cold, just as you will feel hunger, and you might feel pain. If your persona is killed off, you will not, of course, feel that pain. You are guaranteed at least 30 minutes of playtime. If you get killed before your 30 minutes have been used up, you will be given another life and the adventure will automatically restart. Once you have started a life, you will be able to continue until you successfully finish or until you are killed. And if your 30 minutes runs out partway through, any questions? I shook my head. Want to check out the promos? She pointed to the alcoves, and her dragon once again lunged and missed. At, that, at the promo station, 
the computer re recognized my handprint and showed the names of the games I'd played the other times I'd been here, as well as the game I'd played when I'd visited my cousins in Baltimore and we'd gone to the Rasmussen Gaming Center there. The screen showed the dates I'd played and the scores I'd received. I pressed the button indicating I wanted to view the trailers for games that could be played in half an hour or under. Alien Conflict. I didn't even bother with. Nor Dinosaur Safari. I watched the promo for Lost in Time and decided it looked too complicated. It was probably the kind of game where you had to come back four or five times before you got anywhere. Weatherly Manor was a haunted house game that looked like a possibility, though the computer knew my birth date, which meant I would get the toned-down version of those under 16. A Witch's Stew sounded too young, even though the list was supposed to be age-specific. Sort of Tala looked interesting, and I was thinking I'd probably go with that one when I pressed the button for Air Apparent. The voiceover described Air Apparent as a game of strategy and shifting alliances. The king has died. The voice said, are you next in line for the throne or next in line to die? There was a flurry of quick scenes, a castle on a hill, an army assembling, a dragon, someone being pursued through the woods, a wizard tossing powder into the air, and an eagle forming from the powder, and lunging talons outstretched so that he looked about to come straight out of the screen, and I instinctively jerked back. Who can you trust? The voice asked. The screen went dark with an ominous thud, like a dungeon door slamming. A child's voice whispered, Bad choice. And cackling laughter echoed while the name Air Apparent flashed on the screen and then slowly faded. I found myself more inclined toward Air Apparent than Sword of Tala and knew myself well enough to know why. In the montage of scenes, there had been re some really good looking guys probably not the smartest way to choose a game. On the other hand, it made no sense to pick a game specifically because it had nobody interesting looking. I went back to the receptionist. Air apparent for girls as well as boys? The receptionist had been filing her nails while waiting and now she had that she paused, the desk dragon leaped and clung onto the emery board, gnawing at the edge. She shook him off. Yes, she told me, a female character can inherit the throne and become king if she makes the right decisions. Is there only one set of right decisions? I asked. That could make for a frustrating game, the kind you have to play over and over. Heir apparent, she said, is like bean soup. Excuse me, I said. Playing heir apparent, she explained, is like making bean soup whereas Dragon's Doom is more like making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I had no idea what she was talking about. With Dragon's Doom, all you've got to do is remember you're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you'll end up with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Bearing, of course, dropping the bread, peanut butter upside down onto the floor. Of course, I agreed, just to humor her. She continued, but with Air Apparent, you can approach in any one of several ways and still end up with bean soup. You can use pinto beans or black beans or navy beans. You can maybe add a macaroni or not, and you'd still end up with bean soup. But there's all sorts of dangers if you do decide to use macaroni, but you add it too late. It's undercooked, maybe even crunchy, and it's too early and it becomes mushy. You can have too much salt, not enough pepper. Targon might help, or it might make the whole thing bitter. She leaned forward confidently. And that's not even getting into the question of boil or simmer. Just my luck to get an explanation from someone who didn't know when to give up a bad metaphor. Not just one set of right decisions, I interpreted. Okay, I'll go for it. Just then, her desk dragon pooped on the desk. I should have taken it as an omen. All right, chapter two, off to a fantastic start, not. Rasmussen Enterprises must have a vice president in charge of bad smells. It makes you wonder, or at least it makes me wonder, what kind of person takes a job where when you go from home every night and your family asks, how did the day go, dear? You answer, Oh, very nice, thank you. 
some kid I don't know paid a couple weeks allowance money to get hooked up to the computer to enjoy a nice fantasy game, and I got to plunk her into a pile of sheep dung. I woke up thinking I'd been set down in a barn, which is sort of Ras a Rasmussen specialty, I guess. But I could hear birds chirping, and I could feel grass prickling me through my clothes. And when I opened my eyes, there was blue sky and a warm sun above me. I couldn't hear sheep bleeding, not too far off. I sat up and was amazed to find nothing under me except the grass, which was when I realized that the stink was coming from me. My shapeless, scratchy, rough spun, and many-patched dress of unbleached wool was a far cry from the rainbow-hued gown of the Rasmussen receptionist. The people who work for Rasmussen have a pretty weird sense of humor. Why do I put myself through this, I wondered, when my dad, who rarely calls except for the week before my birthday and the week before Christmas, had asked through his secretary what kind of gift certificate he should send for my birthday present, I could have named a clothes store or an electronic store or a bookstore. But no, I asked for Rasmussen, and I'd cross a CPOC picket line to get here. On the other hand, as soon as I stopped sending mental hate messages to Rasmussen, the computer conditioning kicked in. My mind filled with details and memories I'd never had. The effect is like holding two pieces of tracing paper up to the light, one on top of the other. At first, all you can see is a jumble, but as you concentrate on one drawing or on one life, as the case may be, then suddenly you can make it out by ignoring the pieces that don't fit. So. I ignored those parts that were Giannine Belisaro, 8th grader at St. John and the Evangelist School. I ignored Rasmussen Enterprises and its overpriced computer that lets you see, hear, feel, taste, and yes, thank you very much, smell, a fanta fantasy adventure in quarter hour segments that seemed to last four days. I let myself become Janine de St. Jehan, sheep herder. Along with the identity came all sorts of snippets of information that I'd have known if I'd been born and raised in the village of St. Jihan. Most of that information had to do with sheep. If one of those woolly critters came over here, I could milk it, shear it, cure it of ringworm by an infusion of ringwort, castrate it, or help it in case of a breech birth. Not all at once to the same animal, of course. Janine, a voice called. Janine, come back to the house. A dog came bounding up to me, black and white with floppy ears. Did animals in this world talk? No, my implanted memory told me. Well, mostly not, and definitely not in this case. This was merely Dusty, who helped me with the sheep herding. Dusty was old, and her energy came in bursts. But you wouldn't guess that from the way she put her front paws on my shoulder and licked my face to greet me after my mid-morning nap. Hiya, Dusty, I said, at the same time I tried to fend her off. The voice called again, Janine, and this time I recognized it as my mother's voice. That distant, half-buried part of me that had was my true self surfaced long enough to bark, Ha, fat chance. I tried to bury me even deeper. Play the game, I told myself. Did you pay big bucks just to find fault with everything? My real mother lives in New York because that's where her employer wants her to be. So I only see her one week in a month during the school year, and when she comes and stays with my grandmother and me. That, and for two weeks during the summer, which apparently is all she can take can take of me in the, her New York apartment, which is, as she says, cozy for one, I told myself not to be bitter about my mother's attitude toward me. It is, after all, better than my father's. My father demanded a paternity test before the divorce settlement, which I was five, and excuse me very much, but while five might be too young to catch all the nuances, I didn't need nuances to understand that my father wasn't willing to love me, much less pay child support, unless my mother could prove I was his. But none of this, I told myself, was true in this lifetime, so none of it was important. In this lifetime... I lived with my mother named Solita, and my father Dexter, who was a peat cutter, and my three younger sisters and two younger brothers, and we all loved each other 
unconditionally. I stood, despite Dusty's attempts to knock me over. Instinctively, my eyes found the right hut out of the cluster of eight, and entire, the entirety of the village of St. Jihan, in all its glory, all the huts were made of straw and held together with sheep. You can probably guess what. There was my mother, nearly as broad as she was tall, waving to me from the far front yard, a swirl of chickens and small children stirring up the dirt around her skirts. Stay, Dusty, I ordered the dog. Guard the sheep. Dusty lay down on the spot. I'd vacated, resting her head on her paws. I assumed that if a wolf or thieves came, she would know what to do. I waved my woolen cap at my mother and started down the hill. The part of the scene below that didn't fit was the man standing beside my mother. She had an ostrich feather plumed hat and was holding the reins of a fine horse that had obviously never pulled a plow. Between the two of them, man and horse, there was enough gold trim to keep the village of St. Jehan fed for a year. I could see he'd been talking with my mother, though he took great care to keep out of the way of chickens and children alike. Hello, mother, I said when I finally reached them. Hello, sir. It couldn't hurt to be polite, whoever he was. The man wrinkled his nose. Is this the last? He pulled out a lacy handkerchief and breathed through the breathed through that. Did I smell that bad? Yes, sir, my mother said. Stand straight, Janine, and don't fidget. When my mother in the real world deigns to visit, she has the same sort of advice for me, as does my grandmother. It must be a mother thing. I stood straight and didn't fidget. My mother shooed off the children and as many of the chickens as she could. Janine, she said. I have something to, t to say to you, which I probably should have told you before. I wish I could delay it until your father gets home from the bog. The well-dressed man waved his handkerchief at her. Get on with it, woman. Just because she was a computer-generated figment of my imagination was no reason for him to be rude. Hey, I told him, that's my mother you're talking to. If my real mother hung around more, I'd defend her too. But... Wrong, the man said. That's the whole point. Quick on my feet, as always, I said, Huh? This woman is not your mother, and the man you take to be your father is also no relation to you. It made sense, considering the heir apparent scenario had indicated I was one of several in line for the throne. But if ever there was someone who obviously delighted in delivering bad news, this was the man, and meanwhile... This woman, as he'd called her, looked ready to cry. She told him, Sir Deming, you you said I could break it to her. You took too long. I shoved him away from her. Even though I was a full head shorter, I was mad enough to tell him, Look, as far as I can tell, you're just some well-dressed messenger boy. You say one more word to my mother and I'll set the dogs on you. Actually, we only had Dusty, and the chances were... She was asleep by now, but I'll set the dogs on you sounds more impressive than I'll call my dog and if she hears me and if she obeys, she'll make her way down here and maybe even bite you with whatever tea she has left. And it certainly sounds more impressive than I'll set the chickens on you. Deming looked down his nose at me and sneered. I told him, I'm assuming you were paid to deliver a message? With his lips still curled, Deming said, these people who have raised you are in truth your foster parents. You were delivered to them for your own safekeeping. Your true parents, he rolled his eyes. Well, your mother was a servant woman. I could tell he enjoyed telling me that. And my father, I asked, suspecting because of the nature of the game. With a sigh, Deming admitted, King Sinric, God rest his soul. God rest his soul, my mother repeated. The king has died? Deming removed his ostrich feather-plumed hat and bowed his head for a moment of silence. I suspected his sincerity when the first thing he said after that was, and he chose a very inconvenient time to do it. My mother fanned herself with her hand. I have brothers? I asked. As an inhabitant of this land, I had heard talk of princes, but as a lowly inhabitant, I wasn't familiar with their names. Yes, Deming said. 
for someone who was so eager to talk before i told him you certainly seem tongue-tied now what are their names and what are they like there are three princes demi said all older than you which gives them priority over you for the crown as does your he gave a patronizing smile irregular birth he let the smile drop wolfgar is the firstborn deming told me he was educated away from home and has certain he paused to consider perhaps the word i'm thinking of is exotic he has certain exotic ideas something about the way he said it made me suspect that exotic wasn't the word he was thinking of at all ideas about what i asked everything deming said which was no help at all the second son is abbas a young man of incredible physical prowess in the classical sense classical sense what does classical sense mean deming ignored me and lastly kenrick who displays as far as i am concerned altogether too much interest in the magical arts i fought off a mental image of someone in a black cape and top hat pulling coins out of people's ears and sawing lovely assistants in half, for I seriously doubted that's what Deming meant. What? I started. Perhaps it would be best if you waited to form your own impressions. De Deming gave a toothy smile. My mother asked, You're bringing her back to court? Deming nodded. But I thought she was in danger there. Deming pursed his lips to indicate it wasn't his idea. The king commanded it. I said, I thought the king was dead. Deming sighed. He let me know what an idiot he found me. Before he died, it was his, his deathbed wish. Of course, he was quite feverish by then. Deming clearly thought the king hadn't been in his right mind. When you were born, you were a royal embarrassment. Your servant mother had died during the long and difficult labor, and there were those among King Sinric's advisors who pointed out that there was nothing unusual about a young mother and her firstborn both dying under such a circumstance. But the king was a kind-hearted man, Deming sniffed or snorted into his handkerchief. I'll bet it was hard not to picture my real father as the king. So when he knew he was dying, he had a twinge of conscience? I finished for Deming. He decided to see if I was alive after all? Oh, he knew you were alive, Deming assured me. He sent for you to have you named as his heir. Oh, my, my mother gasped. I had assumed that the succession had been left unclear, that I'd have to fight it out with the other three, the other three who were all older than me and who presumably had two royal parents. Why me, I asked. Deming stuffed the handkerchief back into his sleeve. Heaven knows, he said. He wiggled his fingers at me. Go on, he said. Get on the horse. Time to pull yourself away from this sheep. I didn't tell him that so far I liked the sheep more than I liked him. I kissed my mother and my brothers and my sisters goodbye. You're leaving now? My mother cried in dismay. Without saying goodbye to your father? I sent word to him that Sir Deming was here and he should be coming home from the bog soon. I was eager to get the game moving. Rasmussen builds in a little extra time for soaking up the local atmosphere, and because they assume people playing a game for the first time will make a fatal mistake or two and have to rely on additional lives, how many depends on how soon they mess up badly enough to get killed. I don't know how many players actually make it through a game in the first set, set in the first sitting, but my grandmother couldn't afford to send me here on a regular basis. That, in remembering the last time I'd say, said goodbye to my father, had me frantic not to wait around. I'll send for you when things get settled, I promise. Even if the game ended before I could, saying it was worth the look on Deming's face. And that's where we're going to end with this one, boys and girls. I hope you all have a great day. Bye.